interact with the natural world. Um, and one of the big questions that we tend to ask, especially with a justice focus within environmental sociology, is how resources are distributed within society. So the good things like clean air, clean water, access to healthy and affordable food, um, access to parks and public transportation, for example, those are all good things or environmental amenities, right? Um, but there are also a lot of bad things in an industrial society like pollution and toxicants and um, risky or industrial facilities and extractive activities. And we study that, that as well, right? How are exposures to that distributed within society as well as access to those good things? Um, the bigger question here though is who decides? And I'll talk about those two kinds of concepts in the context of environmental justice in just a moment. Um, as an environmental sociologist, we ask what this means for social sustainability and try to think about how to more precisely define and measure what that means since sustainability has kind of become a catch-all. I'm very interested in market-based economies and especially neoliberal capitalism and what that has meant for environmental deregulation um, and environmental injustice. And along with that, looking at what role institutions and inequities play. So sociologists are all about social systems, social institutions, social inequalities. And I look at those in the context of environmental inequity or inequality. So environmental justice itself looks at a few different things. Um, David Schlossberg and many other scholars have done an, an excellent job of articulating kind of the different strands of environmental justice. We tend to think of it as distributive justice, right? So where are those good things? Where are those bad things? And who's exposed to them? Kind of a snapshot. Um, but the real meat of the question has to do with procedural justice, right? Not just the snapshot of how things got to be the way they are, but why that why that is right so who has helped decide who's a, had a seat at the table for making policy decisions and other decisions about how we zone right how we where we put industrial activity and residential activity how we use land and water um whether or not we think about commodifying things like land and water and the ways that different social systems look at those very questions, right? So the big question here is who has a seat at the table to meaningfully and authentically participate? Who constructs the table and invites others in? And often those, the answers to those questions help us illuminate why distributive injustices exist. Um, recognition and restorative justice are really important threads as well. For the sake of time, I, do, I can't go into those as much today, but recognition and restorative justice have a lot to do with looking at restoring ecosystems, restoring social systems. Restorative justice is often used in the context of criminal justice and reforming those systems to be more rehabilitative and healing. Um, and recognition justice is about looking at all the other relations in the world besides human beings and our relationships with them, as well as recognizing um, human groups and, and people that have not long been recognized or had a seat at the table. And in environmental justice, the environment is the built environment too, right? So the tagline of, or the kind of the slogan of the environmental justice movement is often the environment being anywhere where people live, work, play, or pray, or learn. And a lot of this started in connection with the civil rights movement. Um, today, we have hundreds of studies that have been done in sociology and other social sciences like anthropology and political science, um, public health and environmental epidemiology, urban planning, right? There are many disciplines that look at um, geography, of course, that look at the outcomes of environmental injustice as well as their causes. So we have hundreds of studies that show that in general, we see that ethnic minorities, indigenous persons and nations, people of color and low income communities confront a higher burden of various kinds of pollution from air, water and soil pollution, for example. And these are all linked to processes of industrialization, militarization and consumer practices. I want to mention one foundational research study, the United Church of Christ study that was done in the 80s, um, that was done because of a variety of, of um, kind of protests and activism, including in Warren County, North Carolina and other places, and some initial government studies that have been done um, that showed that there might be problems with or patterns of environmental injustice and specifically environmental racism within the US. And the United Church of Christ study done in the 80s found that this was the case. When we looked across the United States and we looked down to the zip code level, we could see that the average percentage of people of color in zip codes 
contain that contain at least one hazardous waste site was double the zip code areas with no such site. And in places with two or more hazardous facilities, the average percentage of people of color in that zip code was triple that in other counties. So the UCC study using rigorous um, statistical methods was one of the first big studies to use regression analyses in this context. Um, found that race was the main driver of this and that there was there were patterns of environmental racism across the US. Now, 20 years later, they followed up and they found that instead of getting better with all of the federal attention to environmental justice and kind of this growing movement, um, that many of the communities that they looked at in their research and nationally face the same problems, but now they're worse. And these problems are worse because of neoliberal policy measures that started in the 1980s, right around the time the environmental justice movement kind of officially started. Of course, environmental justice activism has been going on for a long time. And if we think about colonial activism or colonial action and settler colonialism, um, environmental injustices have been going on for 500 years or more. Um, but when we're zeroing in on this research about the industrial era United States, we can see that um, even though there was more action in this direction from the 1980s onward, government cutbacks and enforcement, weakening health protection, and basically just a dismantling of the regulatory apparatus that could oversee environmental justice and protect it, they've all been kind of taken apart, right, under neoliberal policy measures that tend to deregulate and shrink the capacity of the state to provide these sorts of protections. So unfortunately, greater awareness has not led to addressing these problems. Now, at the Center for Environmental Justice, it's CSU, we are thrilled to be bringing together faculty and graduate students and other folks that are working on these issues in terms of research. We're very excited to also be developing um, training programs, graduate certificates and undergraduate programs that bring together all of the amazing work that's already being done and taught about at CSU. We're also building um, avenues for community engagement with environmental justice communities in northern Colorado and more broadly across the, the American West. Um, and we really hope to become a node for environmental justice in the American West that focuses on extraction and environmental injustice and also focuses on issues like just transitions, right, and how to move um, to more just systems for people working in industries, as well as for ecosystems and other, other species as well. Um, so if you're interested in getting involved, we have many projects that we're just kind of starting, and I have my email at the end, so I welcome that, any inquiries you have or um, time for involvement that you might have. And the little bit of time I have left, I want to give an illustration about what environmental justice issues look like in the context of energy production. And I do this because Colorado um, has so many as kind of the nexus of many of these environmental injustice issues related to water and related to food, but also related to energy production. We have a lot of extraction and energy production sites, and these can be some of the key drivers and sites of environmental injustice. We have oil and gas production going on, right? If we look just east of us in Weld County, that county has one of the highest numbers of wells in the country. Um, we also have uranium and nuclear production going on and legacy sites related to that. And even renewables have environmental justice issues. So um, I just wanna give us an example in the context of unconventional oil and gas production. This is the combination of vertical and horizontal drilling that involves the, the phase hydraulic fracturing that uses a bunch of water and chemicals and which, which are sent down that vertical and horizontal well at really high speeds um, to extract little bubbles of oil and natural gas that are um, that are in kind of trapped in the shale layer where that horizontal drill is going through. This map from the Denver Post shows the um, the density of wells and the legacies that we have of new wells being located near wells that were abandoned or operational in previous decades. Now, in this context, there are distributive inequities and procedural ones. Distributive, again, are the environmental impacts, the exposures to the, the bad things, right? Like megapads that are located near homes and schools in minoritized areas in Colorado. Megapads are, are well pads that have over 20 drills um, or 20 separate well pads going from them. Um, there are also procedural inequities. People don't have a seat at the table to zone or to regulate. Local level control over where drilling ends up or if it happens is very limited. And people lack access to useful translated information about risks. 
my research that was funded by the NIH and was done by with a um, community and group of other researchers as well as community organizations um, found that one of the impacts of this because of institutional inequities and procedural injustices are that people experience negative health impacts in living near oil and gas production. They experience diminished quality of life, increased and chronic stress and self-reported depression. And this is especially true for people who've lived in these communities the longest or who live near development. And I have several articles out there that you can feel free to Google. This is just an example of one of them that focuses on the ways that institutional contexts help impact negative um, or impact negative mental health impacts. I do want to mention that we there are many opportunities for just transitions and Colorado is focusing on those. There's a new office of just just transition in Colorado. Um, and work being done throughout the state and labor and environmental alliances, though they might sound um, antithetical to us right are actually really key to this and there are good examples of these in other places. I want to leave us with this thought of, of how to build better systems, right? Because one of the focus, one of the main focus areas of environmental justice scholars is not just what's wrong, but how do we build better systems? Um, and I want to mention Kate Rayworth's work from Donut Economics. She's a, a UN and Oxford economist. Um, and she has this idea of that kind of encapsulated environmental sociology that looks at this safe and just space for humanity that's represented there with that green kind of donut, right? That's why she calls it the donut economics. Um, and the idea here is to not overshoot our ecological ceiling on several measures and not to fall below social foundations on many measures. Of course, we're moving in that direction, but um, the idea here is that if we re-embed our economic systems within our social and ecological systems, that um, we are able to create social systems that will have more um, chance for realizing environmental justice. So I will leave it there. Um, I'm going to have to hop off to go to a, a department meeting where we're talking about a, hiring a candidate right after this, but I hope to come back in later in the day. And I'm happy to answer questions via email or otherwise. Um, thank you again for inviting me. And just one more plug, if you would like to get involved with the Center for Environmental Justice, Mindy Hill is our program manager. You can email her or you can look, look at all of our stuff at that website right there. And now Matt's going to talk to us a little bit about why spatial justice matters so much once I stop sharing my screen. <laughs> Thank you all. Thanks, Stephanie. I think you actually covered most of the sort of key points. And I think one of the things to just think about with social and environmental justice is these are inherently spatial issues. And um, we need to bring to bear the sort of best technologies we can to solve these issues. And I think the Centroid is really excited to be involved in that space in collaboration with the Center for Environmental Justice and other people on campus. Um, I sort of am just going to quickly close here. Uh, the, the rest of the day, you will have Caitlin as your MC. I'm going to link to the um, agenda, but for the next several hours, we have a series of 20 minute talks. Um, my son is home from daycare, so I will be in and out of this meeting uh, as I trade off with my wife on 